you, if you would please, uh, turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 60, Isaiah chapter 60, and I'm going to read the first three verses. I'm very tempted to read the entire chapter, but I've got a way of getting around that. Uh, so we're going to look at the entire chapter, but just for now, for sake of reading, I want to read the first three verses and also a verse in the New Testament. So Isaiah 60 verse 1, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of their, thy rising. And then just one verse from Romans. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read it to you. Romans 11 and verse 15 it speaks about Israel. It says, if, they, if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. Then he asked this question. And it says, if the casting away of them be reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So when Israel turned their back on the Messiah, it brought blessing to us. Uh, the, the gospel came to the Gentiles. And when they're brought back into the place of favor, we're told that it will be like life from the dead on this planet. It will be like resurrection on this planet. It will be an amazing experience. And so really this chapter deals with that. What's it going to be like when Israel are back in the place of blessing? Uh, when they're converted to the Lord, uh, as we saw last time, we saw the conversion of Israel. Now we're going to look at Israel as the light to the nations. And so that's the theme of Isaiah chapter 60. Now, before we uh, kind of begin to go through the text verse by verse, I love to, when I'm studying the Bible, I love to look at key words in each chapter to see what the kind of general theme is. And often if you get the repeated words and phrases that the Holy Spirit has sought to repeat, uh, we can, you get the idea of what the whole chapter is about. And so this chapter is a glory chapter. There's a lot about the glory of God in this chapter. And of course, the Shekinah glory, when Israel are converted, the Shekinah glory that, that once was over the temple in Jerusalem, but had left, if you read the book of Ezekiel, because of their idolatry, God's glory couldn't share, uh, uh, would not share the place with the idols that they had embraced. And so the glory of God left the temple in Jerusalem and went out by the Mount of Olives and disappeared. Well, now the glory has returned. And this chapter tells us all about this. So I want to just notice, we saw in verse 1, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Verse 2, behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, the gross darkness of the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And then verse 7, speaking of his house, the, the, the millennial temple, and it tells us at the end of verse 7, he says, I will glorify the house of my glory. So that millennial temple will be a place where his glory dwells. And it will be a place where he will glorify that house. Uh, it'll be a house that will be attracting the Gentiles, the people from out the world to come there to worship him. And of course, Israel will be glorified. If you see the end of verse 9, it says, Unto the name of the Lord thy God and the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. And so not only will his house be glorified, but he'll glorify his ancient people, Israel. They will be glorified. Israel, my glory. We often uh, think of that scripture. I think it's Isaiah 46, 13. But truly, Israel will be his glory in this coming millennial day. And then it tells us in verse 13, the glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, the box together to beautify the place of my sanctuary. I will make the place of my feet glorious. And so the, the glory or if you like the riches of Lebanon will be brought to the land of Israel and his sanctuary will be beautified and he'll make the place of his feet glorious. And then the final reference to glory is verse 19. It says, the sun shall no more uh, uh, 
no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God, thy glory. And so the, the glory of God will light up the whole land of Israel. They won't need the sun or the moon to light up that geographical region. The glory of God will light up the whole place. So that's one of the key ideas, is that this is going to be a time when the glory of God is seen in the land of Israel in a remarkable way, and on the people of Israel, and on the house of God in Jerusalem. It's going to be an amazing time. Also, uh, another uh, repeat idea in this chapter is the idea of come. In fact, we're going to see when I give you my outline that, that the idea of come has a big bearing on the outline. But we notice uh, verse 1 again, Arise, shine, for thy light is come. So, so the light has come to the land of Israel and to the people of Israel. And then verse 3, it says, The Gentiles shall come to thy light. So there'll be this great attraction of Israel. There'll be a very attractive people. And, and people, the Gentiles, will flock to thy light. Uh, it'll be attractive. It'll, it'll draw them like a magnet. Uh, and so they'll come. The Gentiles shall come. Verse 4, lift up thine eyes round about and see all they gather themselves together. They come to thee. Thy sons shall come from far. Thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. And so at this time, uh, all the sons and daughters of Israel will return to the land. So they're going to come back to the land. The Gentiles are going to come to the light. Uh, the light's going to come to the land. So there's a lot of coming going on here. Look at verse 6. The multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. All they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. They shall show forth the praises of the Lord. And so, again, there's going to be uh, all these nations coming and bringing their wealth uh, to the nation of Israel. It's going to be quite the scene. Uh, again, verse 7. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nabioth shall minister to thee. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I'll glorify the house of my glory. So again, those of Kedar and Nabioth are going to come. They're going to come and bring all their flocks with them, and they're going to come to Jerusalem. They're going to bring them there. Uh, so it's, it's going to be quite the, the event. Uh, chapter 13, we've already mentioned, the glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee. Verse 14, the sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet. And so, again, that idea of coming, there's going to be a lot of activity, a lot of coming to Jerusalem. Those that once persecuted them will come, but they won't come to persecute anymore. They'll actually come and bow down at their feet, and uh, they'll be reconciled to Israel. And so, all of these uh, key ideas that we've been looking at give us an outline of the chapter. So what we're going to see in verses 1 through 3, God's glory comes to Israel. Verses 4 through 9, the wealth of the nations comes to Israel. Verses 10 through 14, Gentile respect comes to Israel. Instead of being despised of the nations... They're going to be respected, uh, by the, held in esteem by the nations. Gentile respect will come to Israel. And then final section, verse 15 through 22, righteousness comes to Israel. That nation that have in the past sought to go about to establish their own righteousness will ultimately submit to the righteousness of God and they'll be a righteous nation. Uh, righteousness will come to the nation. So it's a, it's a marvelous chapter about the future of the nation of Israel. And it begins with this idea of the light coming. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. And we can't, uh, as it were, dismiss that from what we saw at the end of the previous chapter. What is this light that comes to the land of Israel? Isaiah 59, 20, the Redeemer shall come to Zion, Unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. You see, the light that's going to come to the land of Israel is none other than the one that once visited Israel and stood in their, their temple area and said, I am the light of the world. 
and he will come and he will be the light of the nation of Israel. The one who is the true light, John 1, 9, who lighteth every man uh, that cometh into the world. Uh, he is that light that is going to come. And so he says, arise, shine, for thy light is come. Now, let me just say a few things that need to be said before we go any further. First of all, I want to say this, that the church is not seen in this chapter. Now, one of the, the great errors of today is what I want to call replacement theology, where uh, theologians feel that Israel have finished with, that there's no future for Israel, and that all the blessings that were pronounced on the nation of Israel in their future have now come to the church. And all the cursings that were promised to Israel for disobedience, well, they, they're for Israel, they're not for us. And of course, it's a, it's a completely erroneous way of looking at scripture. So is there any application to us from this chapter? If it's all about Israel and their future and the glory going to come to the land of Israel, is there anything we can get out of a chapter like this that relates to us now, the church? Well, let me give you three things that relate. First of all, uh, I would say this, that during times of revival, and I hope you're praying for revival. I know that uh, it looks unlikely, but oftentimes when things are dark, that's when God comes in reviving power. And I hope you're praying for revival. And one of the things that happens during a time of revival is that we get to taste something of the powers of the world to come. In fact, let me read from Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 5. It says, speaking of these Jewish believers... Uh, and what they'd experienced in those early Pentecostal days. And he says, they have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. And so during revival times, it's almost like we get a little foretaste of what it's going to be like in the millennial age. And actually, uh, people that have lived during times of great revival, they often talk about uh, th that it's, it's like God dwelling on earth. His presence is so real and so everywhere. And, and so they, they liken it almost to the idea of the millennial kingdom. And it is a tasting the powers of the world to come. And I hope we're praying for that. We'll taste that. One of the things that happens during revival is that people flock to the light. Uh, you, you read of uh, revival times and churches bursting to capacity thousands coming to hear the word of God. And it's just like here, the Gentiles flowing up to Jerusalem to the light. Well, during times of revival, people flock to the light. But, but I think we could say right now, we're not living in revival times. Uh, people are not flocking to Westview Gospel Chapel so that you have a difficulty getting people in because the crowds are flocking because of your light. It's not happening right now. But during times of revival, it does. And so in one sense, there's one thing we can get from this chapter is at least it gives us an idea of what revival looks like. Uh, it's a tasting the powers of the world to come. Secondly, as the bride of Christ, we will be with the Lord here on earth because he's, he said he's going to prepare a place for us that where he is, there we may be also. And as his bride, wherever he goes, we'll go. So when he comes back to the earth, we're going to come with him. So the scene that I'm going to describe in this chapter, we will actually be eyewitnesses of it because we'll be there with the bridegroom. Oh, what a, what a thing it's going to be. So as you read this chapter, you can kind of read it with anticipation that the very things we're describing, you're going to witness with your own eyes. That should make it a bit more exciting to think of it in that way. And then perhaps the third thing by way of application is that we're going to see that the light of the glory of God has already shined in our hearts. The Word of God tells us that. And then we're also told that we're to let our light shine before men. That they might behold our good works and glorify our Father that's in heaven. They, so we're going to let our light shine. Uh, remember that Sunday school song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm Going to Let It Shine. And we need to make sure that our light shines brightly in the coming year. And so back to our passage, having tried try to get some practical application for us, uh, let's see 
how it's going to be for Israel. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. Describing the effects of the coming of their Redeemer, as we saw in 5920, the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and to them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. So those that look upon him whom they have pierced, and they're repentant, they're broken, uh, their, their light has come to them. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon them. Like John of old, they will be able to say, we beheld his glory. And actually, his glory will be reflected in their countenance. Just like Moses, when Moses saw the glory of the Lord and he came down the mountain and his face was shining, they're going to be shining. Uh, they're going to shine brightly, reflecting the glory of Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes to the earth. And so it, the, the Shekinah glory of the Lord will be seen in the person of Jesus Christ, just like Transfiguration Mount. Remember on Transfigur Transfiguration Mount, how he, was, he shone so brightly. Remember Saul of Tarsus, when he saw the glorified Lord Jesus, he said that it was brighter than the sun at midday. And so Christ in all his glory, gonna be on the earth, the nation of Israel, are going to see this and they're going to reflect some of that glory it's going to be uh, as it were risen upon them and he says arise and uh, just as the lord said to the crippled lame man at the pool of bethesda rise take up thy bed and walk and his commandment included with it the power to obey it well god is going to speak to this nation uh, that uh, prior to his coming were at a very low ebb we saw that last time in chapter 59 verse 10 we grope for the wall like the blind we grope as if we had no eyes we stumble at noonday uh, as in the night we are in desolate places as dead men and so in their in their bleak condition the lord comes to them they see his glory and he tells them rise the son of righteousness malachi 4:2 will arise with healing in his wings. And he'll say to this desolate nation, arise and shine. And they will. His glory will shine on them. Now, we mentioned that for us individually, we've already experienced that if we're born again. And I want to read a verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, which talks about our personal experience. We've already seen this light the light of the world, that true light that lights, lightens every man that comes in the world. Second Corinthians 4 verse 6 says, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so we've already experienced it, but Israel nationally will experience the same thing that we have in, in experienced individually. When will this happen? Well, we've already said it's going to be a time when Israel seemed desolate, a time of utter darkness. And so verse 2 gives the kind of scene of when this is going to occur. It's going to be after this tribulation period. It says, behold, the darkness, verse 2, shall cover the earth in gross darkness, the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. So it's at this time of great darkness, the darkest time in human history. The Lord Jesus said this, this time, uh, there's never been a time like it before and they won't be afterwards. It will be the darkest time in human history. Time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30 verse seven, time of deep darkness, darkness, gross darkness covering the earth and the people as well. But the Lord in the midst of the darkness will shine Arise upon thee, his glory shall be seen upon thee. And once this happens, they, Israel, will then give light to the dark world. It's interesting that the hope for the future of this world is not found in the United Nations, nor in the Western powers or the Western alliances, but actually what's going to enlighten the world, what's going to make this world a marvelous place. It's not going to be civilization or culture or education, but it's going to be light 
that shines out of Jerusalem, the reflected glory of Messiah upon his people is going to be the light that will enlighten this world. It's going to change this world. So it says, verse 3, the Gentile shall come to thy light. And I meant to say in the key words, four times in this chapter, we get the Gentiles mentioned coming to Israel. Uh, we see it here, the Gentile shall come to thy light. Verse 5, it says, the end of it, the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. Uh, we see it in verse 11. Again, the end of verse 11, the forces of the Gentiles that their kings may be brought. And then again, verse 16, thou shalt suck the milk of the Gentiles and sh shalt suck the breast of kings. And thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy savior and thy redeemer, the mighty one of Israel. So Gentiles, Gentile nations are going to flow into the land of Israel, not to attack them like they did in previous occasions prior to this, the great battle of Armageddon, but they will be flocking there to see the light. And these will be the nations. Remember the Matthew 25, the judgment of the living nations. These will be the sheep nations as opposed to the goat nations that are going to be destroyed. They're the ones that are going to be left on the earth and they are going to flock to see the light that is in the land of Israel, to see the glory. Just like when the day spring on high came to the earth at his first advent, remember the birth of the Savior, Luke chapter 1, verse 78, the day spring from on high was born. Then we saw that wise men from the east came to worship him. Often we talk about kings, we three kings of Orient are. Yeah, how accurate that is, I don't know. But the, truly the kings of the Gentiles what was happening there in a figure, uh, in a sense, was, a, was a, a kind of a small demonstration of what will happen in the last days. They won't be coming to see a baby who is born to be king of the Jews, but they'll be coming to see Messiah, who is the king of kings, the Lord of lords, displayed in all his majesty in Jerusalem. And that city will provide such a blessing to the Gentiles a city that was once the center of world controversy, that uh, burdensome stone for all the nations, Jerusalem, will actually be the center of blessing and the nations will come. And so God's glory comes to Israel. And then we've already mentioned that uh, verse 4 through 9, the wealth of the nations comes to Israel. They'll bring wealth. And uh, we often talk about reparations. Well, the Jews have been treated very badly through the centuries, pogroms, uh, many different occasions uh, where uh, they have had their goods confiscated, their lands confiscated. Well, it's payback time. And the Gentiles, not out of coercion, voluntarily are going to see this nation as a blessing and they're going to come and they're going to bring their wealth to the land of Israel. So he says in verse four, lift up thine eyes round about and see, all they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy sons shall come from far, thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. So, so the idea is this, kind of a picture of those that are already back in the land. They're told to kind of lift up their heads and, and look, scan the horizon. And what they're going to see is, first of all, they're going to see their sons and daughters coming back. This dispersed nation, they're all going to come back. They're all going to come back to the land where the glory of Messiah is. And of course, they're going to come at the command of the Lord. Uh, we know that, that uh, he's going to send his angels and gather together his elect from the four wings of heaven, Matthew 24, 13. But he's actually going to use the Gentiles to do it. And so we, we notice verse five, then thou shalt see and flow together. Thine heart shall fear and be enlarged because the abundance of the sea shall be converted to thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. And so as they scan the horizon, they see their own people coming back, but they see the Gentiles coming as well and actually coming and helping them. In, in fact, in, in verse four, it says, thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. Uh, Darby has the idea is they'll be carried on the hip. And, and the idea is that they're being carried and borne along uh, by, the, by the Gentile nations. They're coming to the nation and they're bringing uh, the scattered sons of Israel back 
to their land, their sons and daughters. And they're also bringing their wealth, the forces of the generation to thee. Uh, that in, implies wealth is brought. And, and so, it says, your heart shall fear and be enlarged. You're, you're, they're, they're going to be just amazed at what they witness and what they see as uh, the nation uh, comes back to the land carried, as it were, by the Gentiles. Now, he gets specific and talks about some of the Gentile nations that are going to be generous towards Israel. And so we, we notice, for instance, verse 6, the multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, and they from Sheba shall come, they shall bring gold and incense, they shall uh, show forth the praises of the Lord. And so they're going to come, and the, these that are mentioned, Midian, uh, Ephah, Sheba, it won't take time to look at it, but if you look at Genesis 25, verses 1 through 4, these, these peoples are actually descendants of Abraham through Keturah, who he married after Sarah had died. And uh, one of them, Sheba, is thought to be what we know as Yemen today. And they're going to bring uh, to the, uh, on their camels and dromedaries, you know, their kind of camel trains, the idea is going to be flowing to the land of Israel, bringing gold and incense. A bit like, again, those wise men who brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh with them, remember. Well, it's going to be a repeat of that, but it's going to be people from these Middle Eastern uh, areas, uh, including Yemen, are going to come with gold and uh, also incense. Now, just look at Psalm 72, just to see that uh, it's not an isolated scripture that says this. This this is already being predicted in Psalm 72, which is a messianic psalm, uh, again, about the glory of the kingdom age. And it says in verse 10 of Psalm 72, the kings of Tarshish, Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents the kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts, verse 15, and he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continually, and daily shall he be praised. And so clearly there is this bringing of wealth to the land of Israel. And it's done from a worshipful heart. I want you to notice this too. Again, they're not compelled. They're not being forced into this. Um, in fact, they're coming with uh, hearts filled with praise. It says the end of verse six, they'll bring gold and incense and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. And so they're expressing these gifts are in a sense, an expression of gratitude to the nation of Israel, perhaps because through them came the scriptures, through them came the savior, through them comes these millennial blessings now as they're uh, they're redeemed and converted and in that place of blessing. And so they will come and they will show forth the praises of the Lord, bringing these tangible gifts. And then also, verse 7, flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together to thee. The rams of Nabioth shall minister unto thee. They'll come up with acceptance on mine altar. I'll glorify the house of my glory. And so Kedah and Nebioth, again, Genesis 25, won't, don't get you to turn there, but verse 13, and also 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 29, tells us uh, that Kedah and, and Nebioth were sons of Ishmael, descendants of Ishmael, and what we would consider to be the modern day Arabs. They too will be coming to the land of Israel, but this time what they're bringing with them is flocks. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together to thee. The rams of Nabioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar. And so it tells us that not only is there going to be a millennial temple, but there also is going to be an altar and there's going to be sacrifices in the millennium. And I love what F.C. Jennings in his wonderful commentary on Isaiah says. He says, in that millennial day, Earth's metropolis, that's Jerusalem, will not lack a temple, nor that temple lack an altar, and nor that altar lack offerings, because they'll be brought 
from the Arab world. Can you believe this? The Arab nations are going to bring all of the flocks and herds necessary to furnish sacrifices that will be offered. Of course, they're not atoning sacrifices in the sense of we know for sure from Scripture that the Lord Jesus offered one sacrifice for sins forever that is never to be repeated. And just as the Old Testament sacrifices, well, they were just really foreshadowings, weren't they, of that one sacrifice. So these will be looking back as a memorial, in a sense, of the person and work of the Lord Jesus. And it will make sense because uh, unlike today, uh, death will be a rarity in the millennial kingdom. It tells us that a child will die 100 years old. And so death is not going to be as common a thing. And so for people to be able to grasp the conception of what the Lord Jesus did, uh, these sacrifices will be a graphic reminder of that lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. But it won't in any way replace that. It's just a memorial of it. And so that's the idea. No thought really of these have been atoning in terms of dealing with people's sin, uh, but, but nevertheless, there will be sacrifices. And we notice too, he says, the end of verse seven, I will glorify the house of my glory. The glory of the Lord will once again fill the temple. You look at Ezekiel 43, just a couple of verses in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 43, verse 5, it says, Fear not, for I am with thee. I'll bring thy seed from the east and gather thee. That's Isaiah 43, and that's why it's not right reading correctly. Sorry, Ezekiel 43. Although Isaiah 43 is a great chapter, but um, Ezekiel 43 and verse 5, where we read this. It says, so the spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Ezekiel 44 and verse four, again, describing the millennial temple. Then brought he me the way of the north gate before the house. And I looked and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And I fell upon my face. And so clearly he says, that he's going to glorify the house of my glory in that day. His glory, his Shekinah presence will be there. And then uh, verse 8, speaking again of this wealth of the Gentiles, who are these that fly as a cloud, as the doves to their windows? Surely the isles shall wait for me, the ship, ship, ships of Tarshish first, to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them, into the name of the Lord thy God, to the Holy One of Israel because he hath glorified thee. Now, Tarshish, many believe, is southwest Spain. And so, again, the Isles uh, speaks of the Isles of the Gentiles. Uh, we know this, Gentile nations bring in their treasures. Why do we say the Isles speaks of the Isles of the Gentiles? Genesis 10, verse 5 says, By these were the Isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, in their nations, Genesis 10, verse 5. So basically, uh, the Isles of the Gentiles divided into their lands. Uh, they're going to come. They're going to bring, again, their sons and daughters from afar. Uh, they're going to come. And again, this idea of uh, look, at, lift up your eyes and see the clouds. Some have said, well, does this speak of uh, the flights, planes coming in? Well, uh, it may be that. But I think the idea is scan the horizon. You're going to see all these coming, returning exiles and all the Gentile nations bringing uh, them and bringing wealth to the, to the nation of Israel. And so he says at the end of it, the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. And of course, God is going to glorify that nation. So from verse 10 onwards, the Gentiles uh, now show respect. This respect comes to the nation of Israel. Instead of being hated and despised by the nations, the Gentiles will give respect to the nation of Israel. It says, the sons of strangers, verse 10, shall build up thy walls. Two things. They're going to build up the walls of Jerusalem, and they're going to beautify the sanctuary in Jerusalem. Uh, we see the beautifying of the sanctuary at the end of verse 13. 
and the glory of Lebanon shall come to thee, fir tree, pine tree, box together to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. And so these activities that are primarily done by the Gentiles, they're, they're going to build up Jerusalem's walls. They are going to uh, beautify the place of his sanctuary. By the way, uh, for us today, one of the things that we should seek to do is to beautify the house of God. I don't mean a physical building. The house of God is, uh, in our day, uh, made of living stones. And we need to do everything we can, uh, as it were, to beautify the house of God. Make it look beautiful in this sick world in which we see ourselves. To beautify the house of God. Build up and beautify the house of God. So notice it tells us about these uh, Gentiles. It says, uh, verse 10, the sons of strangers shall build up by walls, their kings shall minister unto thee, for in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor I have had have mercy on thee. Speaking of the way God is dealing with Israel, in his wrath he smote them, and they deserved it, every bit of it, but in his mercy, and they didn't deserve it at all, or his favor, his, his grace, really, he, he says, in my favor have I had mercy on thee totally undeserved but he's showing mercy to the nation therefore thy gate shall be open continually it won't be like the days of nehemiah where they had to shut the gates for fear of hostility uh, from samballot and and all the others remember but the gates will be open never shut day or night so that men may bring unto thee the forces of the gentiles that their kings may be brought well, king's going to be coming, just like the Queen of Sheba, remember, she came to see the glories of Solomon. Well, they're going to come and see a greater than Solomon, and they're going to bring their wealth. And, of course, the, the, the doors should not be shut. The nation and kingdom, verse 12, that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. Remember, the Lord's going to rule with a rod of iron. And so there'll be absolute compliance. And if there isn't, uh, there will be punishment on those nations just like zechariah 14 they don't come up to keep the feast of tabernacles not going to rain on them and so this is the idea that's being conveyed here and so again the sanctuary will be beautified by the uh by lebanon uh, and of course the various trees fir tree pine tree box together uh, many think not for the construction of the temple but actually uh, for the surround of the temple will be beautified uh, by all of these uh, various trees Verse 14, it says, the sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come, uh, bending unto thee, and all that they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet. They shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. It'll be the end of anti-Semiticism. People will no longer treat the Jew with disdain. But instead, the very ones that have afflicted them, the ones that have uh, sought, uh, despised them, they'll bend to thee, they'll bow down to thee, they'll recognize God has honored these people. And, and so but what a turnaround it will be. And then our final section, verses 15 through 22, is now connected not only with the fact that na the nation of Israel are going to be respected, but they're going to be a righteous nation. And so it says in verse 15, whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. What a wonderful thing to say about the nation of Israel. They're going to be an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. In other words, this is not going to be one of those uh, kind of miniature revivals where Israel get right with the Lord and then go back again to their old ways. But they're going to be a an eternal excellency and a joy of many generations all throughout the millennial kingdom. They're going to stay loyal uh, to the Lord. And also during that time, thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles and shall suck the breast of kings. It was though Israel will not only be submitted to uh, by their former enemies, they'll be supported by them. Right now, there are very few that support the nation of Israel uh, in this world, and it becoming increasingly uh, less and less that support Israel. But in that day, 
they will literally be nourished by the Gentiles and uh, they, their whole land uh, will be blessed in that way. And why is this? Thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. It's all so that they might know that he is their Redeemer, the Lord Jesus. They'll honor him. They'll see that all the blessing has come to them through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the Messiah of Israel, the Mighty One of Jacob. And what's he going to do? He says, for brass, I'll bring gold. For iron, I will bring silver. For wood, brass, the stones, iron. Everything's going to be upgraded. Uh, uh, complete, total upgrade. And notice who's going to do it. I will bring. It was, maybe the Gentiles are going to bring their gold, but who's, who is motivating them? Who's stirring their hearts to do this? I'll bring gold for iron. I will bring silver for wood, brass for stones. I will also make thy officers peace and thine exactors righteousness. Wonderful. He is going to make them righteous. Their officers. There was the corruption that once was so prevalent in the nation will be gone. His officers will be righteous. The, those that are involved in administrative office uh, I'll make the officers peace, exactors righteous, the judge righteousness. And, and so it's, it's, he's going to bring phenomenal changes. These are going to be a, a different people, a different nation. It says, violence shall no more be heard in thy land. They'll no longer have rockets being fired into them from Lebanon and uh, attacks constantly coming to them from various places. It says, violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy wall salvation, thy gates praise. For what a wonderful place this will be. It says, the sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God, thy glory. And again, uh, not that the sun and the moon are going to stop shining, uh, but they will be overshadowed by the glory of Messiah, who is brighter, as Paul once said, than the sun at midday in the Middle East. And so they won't need the sun and the moon. Not that they won't exist, but such will be his Shekinah glory shining in the land uh, that it will supersede the need, need for the sun and for the moon. Of course, when we get to Revelation 21 and 22, we'll see this is going to be true of the new Jerusalem too, that the Lord Jesus and the Father are going to be the light of the new Jerusalem. And uh, of course, the millennium really prefigures that. And many see that millennial kingdom is kind of like the, the drawing room that leads us into the eternal state. And so it's a picture of what is to come. And so it says, thy sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be thine everlasting light. The days of thy mourning shall be ended. No more mourning, no more wailing wall anymore needed. Thy people shall also shall be all righteous because they've come to know Jehovah sit can you the Lord our righteousness they've come to trust in the finished work of Messiah the Lord Jesus who died for them on Calvary and so it says they shall all be righteous in there so there's no fear now of deportations of being scattered being kicked out of the land because of their sin because they'll be righteous they shall inherit the land forever no fear of being kicked out. The branch of thy planting, the work of thy hands, that I may be glorified. And of course, the Lord Jesus will get all the glory for all these wonderful things that occur. And then, of course, there'll be great longevity and also great uh, fruitfulness. I shall, a little one shall become a thousand and a small one a strong nation. Was they're going to be very fruitful. The conditions in the millennium will be such. They'll have large families and large tribal groupings. I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. Now, just one more thing I want to say before we finish uh, this chapter. And I want to go back to verse 13 when he talks about the temple. And he says, 
about the fact, the end of verse 13, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. The place of my feet. So I want to think about this idea of the place of his feet. And I want to look at several scriptures that have a bearing on this idea of uh, his footstool or the place of his feet. So we want to begin in 1 Chronicles chapter 28. 1 Chronicles in chapter 28. And just look at a few verses about his place of his feet. Chapter 28, First Chronicles, verse 2. It says, Then David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in my heart to build a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and had made ready for the building. You get the idea that the temple is to be a footstool of our God. That's what David had in his mind. That's what he intended to do. Isaiah 66, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me, and where is the place of my rest? In other words, this temple is to be place of his footstool, the place of his rest. Psalm 99 and verse 5. Again, we see it says, Exalt ye the Lord your God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Oh, where was his footstool? It was the temple. Worship there. That's where the Jews were to worship. Psalm 132 and verse 7. Psalm 132, verse 7. It says, we will go into his tabernacles, we will worship at his footstool. So as we think of all these scriptures, quite clearly, the place, his footstool, is the place where he puts his feet. And where is that? It's the temple. In this case, the millennial temple. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, the box together, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. So this concludes our look at the glory days that are up ahead for the children of Israel. But also for you and I, we're going to witness a very different world to the world we're living in now. A world where Christ is exalted and glorified. A world where the Gentile nations will come to Jerusalem, not with an idea of destroying it, but lavishing gifts and praising the Lord and worshiping him. And we're going to be there as his bride, witnessing all of these things. And we'll be basking in his glory as well. So what a glorious future we have. But until then, what should we do? Well. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for this marvelous portion of the word of God, and we certainly pray you bless our uh, understanding of it. And uh, Lord, again, we pray for reviving times, that we might experience days where once again crowds flock to the house of God to hear the word of God, and see some of the reflected glory of the Lord in his people. Lord, will you not revive us again, that your people might rejoice in thee. We'll give thee the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.